Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. A word about the support of the podcast. Um, as you know, we uh, we are supported primarily by the Skeptic Society, so your donations there are deeply appreciated. But we also have a sponsor, uh, an advertiser, Wondrium. This is the former uh, teaching company, The Great Courses. They changed their name because they're incorporating many other um, sources of content, intellectual and educational and entertaining content. And whereas it used to be where you had to purchase a course, and back in the day when I was doing this, uh, they would ship you a box of cassette tapes. That's how long I've been a fan of this company. And uh, you'd have to play those cassette tapes on your little Sony Walkman and so on. Then they uh, shifted to digital, of course, like everybody else. And now they've gone to a subscription service. So um, what you do is you access the content through an app, either on your laptop or on your phone, like in my case here. And then you uh, subscribe and to the service and you get access to all the courses and all the lectures. So there's hundreds of courses and therefore thousands of lectures. Most of them are 30 minutes long. Each course has like 12 to 24 lectures. Like this one, for example, is one I'm going to listen to this week. It's called Communism in Power from Stalin to Mao. Look at communism behind and beyond the Iron Curtain. So this is a dozen lectures, each about 30 minutes long. <clears throat> so you can knock those off in about 20 minutes at 1.2 or 1.3 Listening speed, which is what I do it at. Joseph Stalin, the man of steel, the Stalinist gulag state. World War II, steel tempered in the furnace. I'm just skipping along here. Mao Zedong and China's Cultural Revolution, all the way up to Pol Pot and Cambodia's Khmer Rouge. Basically, it's a story of just bad ideas implemented badly. and uh, But it's good to know because it's hugely influential in understanding the 20th century. So here's the deal. You get a free one month trial to Wondrium if you access it through the show. So you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer and you get a month free, free one month trial and you can stop it if you're not uh, into it. But I don't know why you wouldn't be into it. Who wouldn't be into this? It's a fantastic source of intellectual content. Uh, again, go to wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M.com slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R. And you get your uh, free trial. Give it a try. I use it all the time, and uh, and it's great to have them supporting the podcast. So thanks for listening. My guest today is Rejoff Capra. The legendary. His new book is Patterns of Connection: Essential Essays Over Five Decades. Basically, this is in a single volume everything he's ever thought. <laughs> Basically, a collection of his essays that uh, formulate his body of work. Rejoff is the recipient of many awards, including the Gold Medal of the UK Systems Society, the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity from the Media Ecology Association, the Medal of the President of the Italian Republic, the Bioneers Award, the New Dimensions Broadcaster Award, and the American Book Award. He became universally known for his book, The Tao of Physics, an exploration of the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism, which explored the ways in which modern physics was changing our worldview from a mechanistic one to a holistic and ecological one. Several titles followed in more than a hundred editions, including The Web of Life, A New Scientific Understanding of Living Systems, Uncommon Wisdom, Conversations with Remarkable People, and The Science of Leonardo, Inside the Mind of the Great Genius of the Renaissance. Capra lives in Berkeley, California, with his wife and daughter. I also read his book, The Tao of Physics, which was a huge bestseller. And I even used it in a course I taught on the history of ideas in the 1980s until I read Steve Gould's uh, review of that book in the New York Review of Books, reprinted in, in Steve's book, The Urchin and the Storm, a collection of his essays that were on books and ideas. Anyway, so um, to make this conversation interesting, I read portions of Steve's critique of the Tao of Physics, uh, the Tao of Physics and the Turning Point. And to my astonishment, uh, Frejoff Capra says, yep, Gould was right, I was wrong. So it's <laughs> great. This is how it should go. And uh, and then he responded to some of the other criticisms I uh, presented um, uh, because you can only take the holistic view so long, so far. And uh, anyway, so we discuss all the, the big issues in uh, understanding uh, Nature, epistemology, the nature of reality, to what extent we're limited by our models and theories, you know, to what extent physics can be extrapolated to the biological sciences and the social sciences. Um, and of course, in his systems 
research, this is what he attempts to do. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So we go back and forth on some of that. We do have a disagreement about nuclear power as a potential solution to energy capture for the environment and what humans need. Uh, I think we need nuclear power. He is 100% against that. So we ended up agreeing to disagree, but you can hear some of that exchange. And then toward the end, we talk about some of the big questions. What is consciousness? What is mind? What does it mean to be free or not free? Free will and determinism. What happens after you die? Um, and uh, and these great questions. So uh, Frijoff is really, truly one of the most interesting, thoughtful people. Even though I disagree with some of his kind of new agey uh, perspective on some things, but in fact, it's really quite thoughtful and deep and, and definitely worth considering. So enjoy this conversation with Frijak Capra. And if you appreciate the podcast, please do give us some support at skeptic.com slash donate. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so your donations are a tax deductible. The podcast itself is supported by the Skeptic Society, which I direct. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Frijak Capra, the legendary... Your new book is Patterns of Connection, Essential Essays from Five Decades. <laughs> so it's great to have you on the show. I've been a longtime reader of your work. I read The Tao of Physics, The Turning Point, The Web of Life, and then, and then of course, Patterns of Connection, which really is, I'd say, if you, if you wanted a single Frijoff Capra volume, this is it. It's like it's pretty much everything uh, you've talked about in yeah. 50 years. Uh, right. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, let's um, let's just get started. For those that are not familiar with your work, or if they are, they're not familiar with your biography, just give us, I know you're tired of, of saying this, I'm sure, but give us a brief background where you're from and where you went to school and, you know, how you ended up uh, writing the Tao of Physics and all the way up to, you know, last week. <laughs> I, I, could tell you, I could tell you a very different story to make it more entertaining. You know, when Fellini was interviewed about his biography, every time he told a different story. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So, so I, uh, I grew up in Austria, and uh, my mother was a poet, and uh, my father was a lawyer and an amateur philosopher. He had a fairly large library of philosophical books, and both of my parents were uh, very uh, fascinated by art. I grew up in Innsbruck, which is close to Italy, so we spent many of our vacations in Italy. And as a small child already, I experienced the Italian Renaissance and the Italian Baroque. So in, in my family around the dinner table, there was a lot of talk about art and uh, philosophy. And... Uh, Neither of my parents were scientists, but I uh, had a very influential mathematics teacher in uh, high school who awakened in me a love of abstract thinking and, and mathematics and then later physics. I studied physics first in Innsbruck and then in Vienna. And uh, from my student days... I was interested in the philosophy of physics, coming from this philosophical background in the family. And I was very influenced by a book by Werner Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum physics. The book is called Physics and Philosophy, and it's a classic now. In this book, Heisenberg describes very vividly how a handful of physicists in the beginning of the 20th century were confronted with a totally unexpected and uh, disturbing reality, the reality of atomic and subatomic phenomena. And they realized that the whole, all their concepts, their language, and the whole way of thinking was inadequate for describing this reality. And this book really, looking back now, and, and in Patterns of Connection, I have a special tribute to Werner Heisenberg also. And so looking back now, I can say that this book really determined uh, the trajectory of my career, both as a physicist and as a writer. So uh, I got my degree in theoretical physics in Vienna and uh, then uh, moved to Paris in my first postdoc years and, and then to California. 
And uh, during those days, now we are in the 1960s, I was very, very influenced by the counterculture of the 1960s. And again, I have an essay about the 1960s in the book. I love that essay. Uh, the spirituality, the questioning of authority, the sense of community, all this really determined the values and determined uh, my work as an activist. You see, I've, I've never been a pure theorist. From the 60s on, social change has always been on my mind. And so my professional life really has a dual nature as a scientist and science writer on the one hand, and as an environmental educator and activist on the other. So that's sort of a very brief introduction. Yeah, that your parental influence explains your interest in Leonardo, who, of course, was not just an artist in his time. Well, there was no word scientist until the 1850s. So, but he was a scientist. We would today call him a scientist and an artist uh, yes, and an engineer. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and science. The word science uh, had a different meaning. It just meant knowledge. What we call science today, during the Renaissance and up to the 19th century was called natural philosophy. Even Isaac Newton called his famous book, The Principia, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Parenthetically, do you have a, an opinion on to what extent Heisenberg was involved in the bomb project in Germany? Much debate about that, how much he knew. And... No, it's much debated. That's a very complex subject. I think there's sort of a consensus now that he was involved in the bomb project and uh, uh, that he slowed it down uh, consciously to prevent Hitler from you know, being the first to get the atomic bomb. There's a very good play about this by Michael Frayn called yes. Copenhagen. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it's very well constructed how they walk around the, uh, on stage as if they're particles going around right. uh, a, a nucleus. Right. I thought of uh, when you were talking about Heisenberg, or Heisenberg's uh, physics and philosophy book, I was reminded of Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington's book on same subject, physics and philosophy. I forget the title of I think it was The Nature right. of Natural Law or something like that. Let me see if I have it here. Anyway, this is the passage I, um, I've quoted uh, to make the point that uh, we're limited based on how we, the kind of instruments that we use to measure uh, life. This is from my book, Why People Believe We're Things. So this is Eddington, who says, Let us suppose that an ichthyologist is exploring the life of the ocean. He casts a net into the water and brings up a fishy assortment. Surveying his catch, he proceeds in the usual manner of a scientist to, to systematize what it reveals. He arrives at two generalizations. One, no sea creature is less than two inches long. Two, all sea creatures have gills. In applying this analogy, the catch stands for the body of knowledge which constitutes physical science and the net for the sensory and intellectual equipment we are using to obtain it. The casting of the net corresponds to observations. Now, an onlooker may object to the first generalization and say it's wrong. There are plenty of sea creatures under two inches long, only your net is not adapted to catch them. The ichthyologist dismisses this objection contemptuously. Anything uncatchable by my net is ipso facto outside the scope of ichthyological knowledge and is not part of the kingdom of fishes, which has been defined as the theme of ichthyological knowledge. In short, what my net can't catch isn't fish. <laughs> I think that bears a lot of uh, reflection on your, your whole work, your life's work. Absolutely. And, and this is, in fact, a very famous passage. I think this has influenced uh, you know countless uh, historians of science and has been commented on by you know Richard Feynman and and other great uh, scientists and and in fact uh, the the fact that what we see depends on how we look uh, was brought into science by Heisenberg and was formalized mathematically in his famous uncertainty principle. And more recently, during the 1970s and 1980s, so uh, about 50 years later, uh, it uh, was uh, enhanced and, and expanded uh, 
by the so-called Santiago theory of cognition by Maturana and Varela, who uh, who said that um, again we don't uh, represent an independently existing world, but we bring forth a world not only in our process of observation, but in our whole process of living. And so cognition, the process of knowledge, becomes very closely linked to the very process of life. This is a major achievement of 20th century science, and it carries on the tradition of Heisenberg. Yes, all that's true. On the other hand, there is progress in science. We do reach consensus. You know, global warming is real and human cause. The germ theory of disease is, is real. Plate tectonics explains the movement of continents, the Big Bang. Absolutely. Yeah. So how does that happen if it's so well, so dependent upon our equipment and our cognitions? Well, uh, you know, everything in the natural world is interconnected. That's also, you know, one of the great insights of 20th century science. And therefore, in order to really understand any phenomenon completely, that is, in order to, to get at the truth of things, if you wish, we would have to understand all its connections to the rest of the world, including to ourselves, our apparatus, our method of observation, and so on. And this, of course, is not possible, because if there are these myriad connections, you cannot take into account all of them, especially not in a, in a theoretical model. And so what we do in science is we say that, yes, everything is interconnected, but some of these connections are more important than others. And in a first approximation, I will leave out most of them and take into account only some. And then in a second approximation, I will take into account more interconnections, and therefore my theory will be more accurate. So what this means is that in science, we never deal with the truth. We deal with approximate descriptions of reality. But we, we have a way of improving them systematically, and that gives us great confidence in science. So we know to come back to climate change, uh, we know that um, you know emissions of CO2 um, heat up the atmosphere, and this causes you know droughts, hurricanes, forest fires, all the things we are now witnessing. But we don't know which catastrophe will happen exactly when and where, because the mathematical models, climate models, are very complex and don't have that predictability power. But qualitatively, we can predict the things are getting worse if we don't change our ways of life. Yeah, I think of science as a social process in which consensus is reached among experts in a particular field through kind of a competition of ideas, a, you know, conjecture right. and refutation as Popper described it. And that by the time you and I consume it in popular science magazines, we can be reasonably confident that it has been uh, vetted by the professionals and that you know, we're probably not yeah, reading something absolutely. that's very likely to go uh, be false, falsified. Yeah. Let me ask you about, um, since the, the, just a little bit more biographical information, I'm always interested yeah. in, in, in how lives turn out. You know, the role of parents, you know, genetics, parents, upbringing, uh, peer groups, mentors, teachers, and then, and then the times that you're raised in. So I loved your essay on the 60s in, in Patterns of Connection. Um, you know, that was a unique decade, I think. But maybe somebody like a Gen Z or a millennial would go, no, 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 not the 60s. It was the 80s that was the great decade or something like that. You know, we're all pr products of that kind of special, almost imprinting time when the music and, uh, you know, the shows, the films, the novels, the, the kind of cultural richness that we are swimming in uh, influences us. So t tell us about uh, your experience of the 60s and how it influenced you and and do you think it was unique, or is it unique just to you because that was your generation? I'm slightly behind you at age 67 here. Yeah. Well, uh, I I believe uh, it was, uh, if not unique, uh, it was a very decisive moment uh, 
Uh, I grew up in Austria, and uh, in the 50s, the United States was sort of a shining example of progress. We admired, as kids, we admired everything American. Uh, I listened to the uh, American Forces Network radio station, to the Voice of America, to the Jazz Hour. I was a big jazz fan uh, and still am. So every, everything American was just wonderful and very exciting. And in the 60s, this, this uh, assessment changed because we became aware, many of us in the so-called counterculture became aware of the excessive materialism of, of that culture and were longing for uh, more meaning, uh, for uh, also uh, you know, more community and were questioning uh, authorities. So there was a huge questioning of authority. Uh, the civil rights movement questioned the authority of uh, white people over uh, colored over over black people. Uh, the uh, student movement questioned the authority of professors over students in political matters, not in the teaching, but in in political decisions. The feminist movement questioned the authority of patriarchal culture over women. The, the pro, so-called Prague Spring under Dubček questioned the authority of the Soviet regime over, over uh, Prague. Uh, psychotherapists and psychiatrists began to question the authority, their authority over their patients. And in psychotherapy, there was a significant shift from calling them patients to calling them clients. And so it went on and on. And this questioning of authority was not only expressed in grassroots movements, but also in the arts. We had, we had rock music, we had free jazz, we had the living theater, we had uh, you know, new uh, dance and ballet um, forms, we had new, new novels, and it just went through the arts, through politics, and through the whole intellectual sphere. And I got my PhD in 1966 in Vienna and then moved to Paris and was in Paris in May 68 during the memorable student revolt, which is still in Europe just known as May 68. And so this is where my political sensitivity was radicalized. And then I moved to California to uh, teach and do research at the University of California. And there <clears throat> I embraced the whole counterculture. I read books about Eastern mysticism. I practiced meditation. I experimented with psychedelics all the while also working as a physicist at the University of California. So this was a tremendous influence. And I would say that the 60s involved an expansion of consciousness in two directions, in the direction of uh, the spiritual dimension, what psychologists at the time began to call transpersonal consciousness, and in the direction of social consciousness, questioning of authority. And the first kind of expansion led me to explore the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism, and uh, to write my first book, The Tao of Physics. And then, you know, in, in uh, the, my remaining uh, career, I always included also the social dimension, as I mentioned before, and, and so the values of the 60s really uh, are the, the core values, my core values, which were formed during these formative years. Looking back on it, do you think there are some parts of that movement that you just rattled off many details that went too far, some that didn't go far enough, some that hit it just right? Well, well of, of course, some went too far. Uh, I mean, take the Black Panthers, for instance, which were a memorable uh, phenomenon during the time that, that I also embraced. 
they did a lot good of good things in terms of schools, food programs, and so on. But they also went too far in terms of violence, or you know, uh, you know, psychedelics were a very powerful tool for the expansion of consciousness. But many people overdosed, and that had tragic consequences. They didn't use them wisely. So, of course, you know, people went too far in, in, in many cases. Yes, and on the other side, though, let's say the civil rights movement, as much progress as it made, it didn't, it didn't incorporate gay rights and same-sex marriage and parts of uh, the women's movement, which took until the 70s for, the, uh, for feminism and really until the 2000s, well into the 2000s for same-sex marriage and gay rights. Right. So uh, what we can see is that, in, in my view, in the 1960s, we protested, we questioned authority, <clears throat> we, we had a lot of protest movements, but we didn't really have an alternative. We didn't have an alternative vision of a future, of a, a, a more humane and ecological future, as we would say now. And that came, as you just mentioned, in the 70s with two big, new movements, the, the feminist movement, which was actually not new, it was the so-called second wave of feminism, and the ecology movement. And I think feminism and ecology provided two pillars of uh, a new kind of being in the world, a new kind of seeing the world, which then in the 80s were uh, formulated politically in terms of the green movement, the greens in Germany and then green parties around the world, uh, which, which combined ecology, feminism, the peace movement, and uh, the social democratic movement in Europe. So this had the political formulation, and then this continued in the 1980s, and uh, by the end of the 1980s, then we had the Gorbachev phenomenon, that Gorbachev uh, accepted the premise of the peace movement that a nuclear war could never be won and therefore should never happen. And so this new thinking of Gorbachev and his uh, you know, so-called perestroika restructuring uh, was very much in sync with, with these 60s movements by the time we are in the 1980s. And so then we had this momentous year of 1989, where the Berlin Wall came down, Nelson Mandela was freed, and we thought that with Gorbachev and all these movements, we were now really ready to turn the page and, and have a new kind of, of society. Uh, the end of the Cold War, which gave us the so-called peace dividend, we thought, now we don't need to spend all that money on war and the military, and we can really restructure society. Well, it didn't happen. The, the peace dividend uh, fizzled out, and then something happened that nobody had foreseen, and that was the information technology revolution in the 1990s. And so there was a new materialism, a new greed, a, uh, a very strong increase of unethical behavior in the corporate world. And it took the, the counterculture of the 60s, a whole decade, the decade of the 90s, to absorb uh, and understand this new development. And the result was then the emergence of a new global civil society, which I believe is the greatest legacy of the 1960s that now we have an international coalition of NGOs uh, who work on, uh, as, as the slogan uh, goes, another world is possible, which was uh, you know, a, a slogan formulated in, in Brazil at the World Social Forum. So, uh, you know, my feeling is that these social changes do not go you know, gradually, you know, along a linear trajectory, but there are revolutions, there are, you know, back swings, there are backlashes, there are pendulum swings, uh, 
So it, it seems quite chaotic. And in the epilogue of my book, I, I go through these uh, sequences that are just briefly outlined. Yeah, it, it shows that there's no uh, march to history through some mystical, magical force that uh, pushes things along. It's up to yeah. us. We have to do it. And sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. You know, Gorbachev was, you know, well, open to change and Putin is not. And, you know, we just happen to get yeah. uh, Putin instead of somebody else that would have been more open to it. And, you know, part of the problem there was they didn't make the transition to a democratic society or a constitutional republic. They just reverted back to a, a czar-like rule in Russia. And, you know, we thought we could do the same thing in yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, let's bring them democracy. This is good. Democracy is good. Uh, and look what all the good things it's done around the world elsewhere. So let's go there and, and spread democracy. Well, that didn't work out so well either. So it, you know, it very much depends on the particular circumstances and how we yeah. uh, uh, respond to mm -hmm. it. And the World Wide Web was supposed to do everything you just described, you know, this global community. This is what we yeah. were told. Let me, uh, Michael, let me bring in something else of, of our recent history. Uh, as we speak now, uh, the uh, American Congress is debating two policy packages, which are radical packages in terms of social policies. People say this is the most radical package of policies since uh, Roosevelt's New Deal. And uh, it's interesting uh, that uh, our President Biden, who during his life, whole life was a centrist, uh, you know, proposes this radical uh, package of social policies, social and environmental policies. How did this happen? Well, I, uh, in my view, again, to see the patterns of connection, how everything hangs together. Ten years ago, we had the Occupy movement, which uh, was short-lived as a movement in terms of occupying public spaces and so on but which uh, created a very ingenious uh, phrase, the phrase of uh, the 1% versus the 99%, and they said, we are the 99%. And they introduced um, the uh, issue of uh, economic inequality, which is, has been increasing over the years and decades, introduced this in the into the political dialogue. And from that time on, you know, economic inequality became a major issue of public dialogue. It was embraced by Bernie Sanders uh, because it fit very much with, with his whole uh, policy uh, and, and worldview. And when Sanders in the last presidential election ran against Biden for the nomination, he attracted a huge m youth movement because of this phrase, the 1%, and because of introducing economic inequality, and of course also, you know, the climate catastrophe and a lot of other things. So uh, Bernie Sanders did not get the nomination, Biden got the nomination, but Biden was smart enough to know that without the youth movement supporting Sanders, he could not win the general election. And so he made a pact with Sanders, and they uh, constituted a task force to work out the policies of the Biden presidency. And uh, the result was, uh, you know, this infrastructure package and, and this so-called build, build Back Better package of social policies. So we see how a small movement with a very ingenious idea and very strong values can have an influence over the years and over the decades in this interconnected world. Now, let me ask you that then, since we're on that subject, since you've studied some economics and you've written about it and talked a lot of economists, um, how many mm. trillions of dollars can we spend before the other shoe falls? Something like massive inflation. So we're talking about $2 trillion on the two wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, $2 trillion in COVID aid and uh, rescue package, uh, almost a trillion dollars back in 09 with the um, bailout, uh, the too big to fail bailout. And now, 
hmm. you know, uh, Biden wants to spend another $2 trillion on the infrastructure and, and so forth. Uh, now, I, I understand this modern monetary theory proposes that because it's not based in gold or any anything other than just fiat money based on the sol solid basis of the U.S. government, uh, we can print all we want. But my other economist friends tell me, no, 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 we, there, there's going to be a massive uh, a kickback on this. I mean, sorry, I influence and in, in, in with uh, inflation and whatnot. Well, I think I think uh, it, both are probably true. That it is true that uh, money is just a tool and can be created with a keyboard stroke by banks by just creating loans. Whenever a bank gives a loan, it creates money. It in the old days, the loan had to be covered by gold. In the very old days, <laughs> and then you know had to be covered. Half of it had to be covered, and ten percent, and so on. And I don't know what the situation actually is now, but but money can be created with with a stroke of of the computer. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I agree that you know a big national debt must have some consequences. But isn't it curious that whenever it comes to social spending, people ask, "Can we afford it?" Whenever it comes to military spending, this question is never asked. We don't even know what the military does with the money. And the Pentagon asks Congress for a certain budget, and Congress gives it 20% more, you know, without, without you know, even negotiating or anything. So I think it's a, it's a matter of values, not, not a, a matter of, uh, you know, debt. Yes, I'm fond of pounding on conservatives who claim that they're in favor of small government, uh, but they're not. They love big government when it comes to military, no. jails, prisons, court system, uh, uh, immigration policy. Uh, you know, there's this, this, you've seen them holding these signs about vaccines, you know, my body, my choice, to which I say, oh, would that apply to women and their reproductive choices? Oh, no, 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 not yeah. that part, no. <laughs> That's right, not their body. Right, that's our body. Right. Well, okay. Well, anyway, that's a yeah. little bit of a sidebar. Um, have you been disappointed in what's happened with the, the World Wide Web? Uh, you know, for the, all the promise that it had, almost achieving a mystical force like Teilhard de Chardin's New Sphere, you know, a global mind, a global brain, we're all going to be united. And now all of a sudden we're hearing talk of breaking up the tech companies and the social media companies because they've made us even more divided than ever. Well, I, I think uh, breaking up the social media and tech companies is just a part of needing to break up all big companies, you know, all the big corporations, whether it's banks or the pharmaceutical industry or the oil industry, uh, you know, once they get too big, uh, what, what we can observe is that uh, these uh, companies and corporations have a certain purpose in the beginning. You know, they produce goods and services, and that's their purpose. And once they get to a certain size, then the purpose is shifted and making money becomes the purpose. And so when we, when we transform the role of money from being a tool for buying and selling to being a measure of success and a measure of value, you know, then, then we get into trouble. And so uh, we need to, uh, you know, revert that and, and uh, create a new set of values or the old set of values of uh, the well-being of humanity and the well-being of the earth should, the, should be the guiding values. And they are not in these big corporations. Yeah. Well, I mean, that sounds good. But in order to become a big company, to do be, be effective at what you do, you need a lot of employees. And to make payroll every month, you need a lot of money, debt. And so that debt is carried by taking your, pu your, your company public. So you can raise hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars, and then you can grow and produce like the equivalent of you know iPhones for... A couple hundred bucks, whereas if Apple was a small little mom and pop company, this thing would be ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or whatever. Uh, 
And then once you go public, now your obligation is to the stockholders and you have to make money. So it's kind of built into the system. And I don't see what the workaround is other than you have a trust regulatory state and a trust busting agency that says you have a monopoly, we're going to break you up or something like that. I mean, you know, uh, Zuckerberg just said the other day that Facebook is just responding to what the public wants and that their job is to make money and that so they they adjust the algorithms to drive more negative news, which the media does anyway. I mean, the media, by definition, reports just the bad things that happen. That's its job. So you get this availability heuristic where we only see the bad things and it feels like life is terrible. And then in the case of Facebook, apparently you have these younger kids on there and they're driving them to greater levels of depression and anxiety and so on. And we're more polarized because that's all we see is all the hate thrown back and forth between the two political parties say and all this, you know, as the result of this system I just set up, how would Facebook ever get big to do what it can do without public you know, money? That is an IPO, something like, yeah. you know, stock company. Well, let let me say, Michael, that I don't have all the answers. <laughs> what? And, I thought you and, did. You know, <laughs> I, no. So, but what I can say is that your beginning premise that companies need money to to meet their payrolls has been severely distorted. Because people like Jeff Bezos and and uh, you know the the CEOs of these giant corporations, these multi billionaires, don't use the money to pay their employees a living wage and and you know healthy working conditions. On the contrary, they exploit the employees to the maximum to make more money for their own good because. Once you have a certain amount of money, you don't use it to buy things anymore because you've got everything already. So what what money is for those billionaires is uh, a measure of power. And, and, you know, their sense of power is unlimited. Therefore, they, they want to make an unlimited amount of money. And if if one billionaire has two or three billion less than his competitor, then he may get depressed and may become an alcoholic, you know, although they are super, super rich. So it's, it's, all, it's all very relative. And again, the, the basic error is to, to change the role of money from a tool in, uh, in the economy to a measure of power and a measure of value and a measure of success. That's what we need to change. Well, there are billionaires like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, Ted Turner, and so on, who who do have a social conscience. And, and in, in a way, they're kind of competing for how much of their money they can give away. As a product of the 60s, do you think without, let's, let's just leave aside the regulatory state and the, and the trust busters and, and the government top-down con, uh, solutions to these problems, could you do it from the bottom up? just through social pressure and also rewarding people who uh, give away a lot of their money, the Bill Gates, the, the Warren Buffetts, and that this is a good thing. And then there's a competition amongst the billionaires to see how many, how much of their money they can give away to good causes. Well, of, of course, that, that is also a trend and that needs to be enforced. And, and coming back to uh, the, the previous uh, comments you made that, that uh, you know you get uh, on the stock market and then you know money is a speculative tool uh, that also can be regulated and and you know you know from the most radical point of view there should be no speculation there should be no financial speculation this whole financial casino is extremely harmful <laughs> so uh uh, I, I recently uh, read uh, an article by the uh, activist and author uh, David Corton, who is an old friend and colleague of mine from, from way back in the 60s, actually. And uh, Corton says uh, that uh, we will prosper pursuing life or we will perish pursuing money. The choice is ours. And that sort of encapsulates this this idea. Yeah, of, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot well of being, 
it, let, let me point out, uh, a lot of regular people, just middle-class people, uh, have their retirement accounts, their 401ks and their IRAs and SEP IRAs and so on, parked yeah. uh, securely in the stock market, and they're counting on it continuing to go up 10 to 15% every year, such that when they're in their 60s, they can retire and live off that. That didn't used to happen. The stock market used to be for rich people. Now it's regular people. So that seems like a good thing, pulling yeah. regular people out of poverty and giving them a chance at a better life later when they're a little older. Yeah, but the stock market can also go down and then they lose their savings. Well, it, so it does go down. It's not it, a healthy. It, it goes up and down, up and down, but it goes up and down and down like a sawtooth that the blade is going up. <laughs> Historically, of course, the whole thing had come melting down like it did well, in 08, 09, but the it bounced back. The stock market is not the stock market is not part of my expertise, so <laughs> I'm not let me going read, to. Let me read you something from the patterns of connection here. Um, here's you. We find ourselves today in a state of profound worldwide crisis. We can read about the various aspects of this crisis every day in the newspapers. We have an energy crisis, a healthcare crisis, high inflation and unemployment, pollution and other environmental disasters, the ever increasing threat of nuclear war and the rising wave of violence and crime. Uh, Friedrich, you could have written that yesterday. This was written in 1982 in an essay called The Turning right. Point, A New Vision of Reality. <laughs> so how do you think about, you know, kind of looking back at that, you know, what you were thinking about in 1982 and, and what's happened since then? Well, uh, many of the, the problems that I pinpointed at the time have got worse. Uh, you know, shortly after I wrote that, a few years after I wrote this essay, I started writing about uh, global warming. And of course, that has increased. To, to the, the current catastrophe and, and emergency, uh, I think the threat of nuclear war has diminished and uh, nuclear connected with that uh, nuclear energy is definitely on its way out because it's not physical, economic, e economically and politically. And so, you know, that they have, and then the rise of the global civil society is a remarkable phenomenon that began in the 1990s. So I would say that uh, the crisis of perception that I highlighted in this essay has become sharper. But we also have a lot of uh, uh, grassroots movements for, you know, feminist ideal for uh, LGBT rights, for uh, uh, healthy nutrition and a, a holistic approach to health and healing. So we have a lot of grassroots movements that are very positive. And on the other side, we still have the corporate world, you know, pursuing money and power without any regards of the consequences. And, and this clash of those two uh, worlds uh, has become more more severe, I think. I see a lot of progress since the early 80s. Um, you know, I was a young adult at the time, and uh, but you can just see it in the, you know, the data tracking um, the uh, attitudes towards civil rights, for example. I mean, conservatives today are more liberal yeah. than liberals were in the 70s, socially anyway. Yeah. You know, we've all had our consciousness expanded to be more receptive to people different from us. You know, the rates of violent crime have really plummeted since the early 90s. They peaked in 93, plummeted right. after that, slight spike in the last 15 months or so, probably because of COVID and the pandemic and all that stuff in the in the BLM movement. Yeah, uh, speaking of the pandemic, you know, that that's another very recent, uh, very important phenomenon. And my, my last essay in terms of chronological sequence in, in the book is, is about COVID-19. Uh, and uh, so what, what we have learned is um, uh, that, uh, no, I'm, I lost my train of so thought now, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, uh, we no, I'm talking, just going to, you're talking maybe about, about we were, the pandemic. We were talking about uh, well, things that have changed yes, since the early 80s. Um, the pandemic, the pandemic uh, 
threatened our lives and sharpened our awareness. And as a consequence, social poli policies that were considered fringe politics just a few years ago are now seriously being debated, even by conservative politicians, such as a, a guaranteed universal income and, and various, uh, the, the Green New Deal and, and other social policies. And, and of course, uh, during the pandemic, several countries have uh, paid workers to make up for the losses of jobs they had. Uh, in, in Denmark, the government even paid, you know, independent uh, uh, professionals like myself, 80% of their lost income. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Spain, hospitals were nationalized. In California, uh, hotels were used to house the homeless. You know, a lot of very radical social policies uh, that, uh, you know, have become um, public part of the public dialogue in, in the pandemic. So the pandemic has taught us uh, some very useful lessons. And the question is, will we heed those lessons? Will we apply them to the climate catastrophe? And, you know, will we pursue these social and environmental policies? Now, with regard to energy, I don't see how we can can get away from fossil fuels without nuclear in the equation of what's going to replace them. So that's one aspect. And here I was influenced by Stuart Brand, who I believe you know, uh, and you know he makes yeah. a pretty strong case for nuclear. We need just but better nuclear uh, power. The the problem is is that we haven't been allowed to experiment with nuclear power uh, stations and plants. It's so overly regulated because we have a, a zero tolerance for failure. Uh, that it hasn't been allowed to develop like other technologies and industries. But solar, wind, geothermal, all that just doesn't add up. And therefore, you end up with still burning fossil fuels. That's one aspect. And the second aspect is, it's one thing for you and I, sitting here in California, enjoying a good life, to tell the rest of the world, you shouldn't use fossil fuels because of this coming crisis of, of global warming. Uh, but what if you're a third world country and all you have to burn is coal? And we say, well, you can't do that anymore. So then what have they got left? Cow pies and wood. Uh, you know, they without nuclear well, power, what are they going to do? It hardly seems fair for us to tell China, you can't burn any more coal. I'm, I must say that I strongly disagree with, with the, your view. Uh, uh, in, uh, in my uh, textbook, which is one of the last books I, I wrote together with a colleague, Pierluigi Luisi, The Systems View of Life, I list, I think, seven, what I call following Al Gore, seven inconvenient truths about nuclear power, which make nuclear power absolutely you know, inappropriate and unfeasible. And uh, let me first talk about third world countries. You know, it so happens that most third world countries have an abundance of sunlight. So solar energy would be very strong in these countries. And it has been shown uh, by study after study that renewable energy sources can very well satisfy our energy needs. So we don't need fossil fuels. We don't need nuclear. Of course, the, the shift is not easy because the whole infrastructure now is geared toward those power sources. The, sh the shift is difficult, but uh, we definitely don't need nuclear. Uh, just to give you some, some of the reasons why, why it's not feasible. One is uh, that it is based on uranium, which is a limited resource. And uh, the scarcer the uranium deposits get, the more difficult it is to retrieve them, to mine and mill them and so on. And so we are spent, as time goes on, we would spend more and more energy just uh, getting the uranium out of the earth and, and enriching it so that at a certain time, and this has been estimated, a nuclear power plant would produce just the amount of energy that is needed to make it running. So that, that's one thing. 
Another thing is the link between nuclear energy reactors and nuclear power and, and, and nuclear weapons, which we see in, in Iran. The whole uh, dilemma about the Iran politics is that you can't separate the two. Uh, the, the, a third one would be nuclear waste. Nobody has yet found a solution uh, of where to put the nuclear waste. Uh, a fourth one would be that nuclear power also admits, emits CO2 in the, in the whole process of getting the uranium out of the earth, preparing it, building the nuclear power plant, and so on. Another one would be that it favors a highly centralized and rigidly controlled, for security reasons, a rigidly controlled regime, which is not what we want. We want a, 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 a widely distributed, direct grassroots democracy as a, as a political regime. So there's argument after argument which shows, and, and that... I haven't even mentioned the dangers of, you know, nuclear explosions and leaks and so on. Even without those, it's it's just absolutely not feasible. Yeah, but so how I'm, many, I'm how many, very how many people yeah, die every nuclear. year in in uh, due to coal uh, and other fossil fuel mining procedures versus nobody has yeah, died in, from from nuclear explosions yeah, here nobody dies in the United in States. Solar or wind power. Yeah. Say it again. Solar power, wind power, wave power, you know, nobody dies there. Yeah. So, um, well, I guess that, that this this turns on... Let's agree to disagree. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't have a dog in the fight. If, if, if the research shows that, in fact, solar and, and, and wind and geothermal and so on could cover 100% of our ever-increasing energy demands, including when China... Yeah. In India, come full on on board as well as developing countries. If that's true, then sure, yeah. let's do that. But I'm not sure it's true. It's see, I, I read other reports. I hear, I read you. Okay, that sounds good. I read Matt Ridley or or Bjorn Lomberg. It's like no, not even close. It wouldn't even be like 10 percent of our energy needs. We have to have nuclear, and 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 everybody agrees the nuclear technology at the moment is not great. Uh, but what about you know these? these much smaller size, like the size of my house here, say, instead of these massive structures or even portable units that you could haul around to some of these uh, poor countries and just turn them on. And what about fusion? You know, in other words, we just haven't had the research in nuclear that we've had in other industries because of this fear of failure. Well, I, you know, I have followed fusion very closely being a physicist. Yeah. And, and from the 70s on, Whenever you talk to fusion experts, they would say, well, give us another 10 years, you yeah. know, <laughs> and that fusion is just not ready. You know, the crisis is too acute. You know, we need to shift away from fossil fuels and fusion is just not there. Fusion so, is, fusion is uh, ten, ten, as they say, fusion is 10 years away and always will be. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Following on from that, the Tao of Physics, I, I, I think I mentioned in an email that I had actually used that book in a course I was teaching on the history of ideas. I love that book. And then I read oh, Stephen Jay yeah. Gould's review of that book in the New York Review of Books. You probably remember this. And uh, then Steve later, yes. he, he later became a friend and so on. So I was just rereading. He reprinted the review of your book in uh, his little book, An Urchin in the Storm. So I, I just wanted to read you what he uh, writes, and then and then you respond, because this gets to the kind of epistemology of of uh, systems thinking and comparing Eastern and Western traditions and so forth, and just get your uh, response to that. Uh, let's see. So Gould is writing here, as in his previous book, The Tao of Physics, Capra particularly stresses similarities between Eastern religious traditions and modern physics. For example, after laying out the dichotomy of yin and yang, he decides that the complementarity of wave and particle descriptions for atomic phenomenon records the same insight about reality constructed as an indissoluble system not built from unambiguous items eventually unpacked at minute sizes. But why should I accept this analogy as expressing a real unity in nature? Am I being too crudely analytical in noting that Chinese philosophers were not discussing basic particles even if they tried to construct a comprehensive system? 
Might not their yin and yang be reflecting our mind's struggle to grasp a complex reality by dichotomizing rather than reordering nature herself? And why should I view the twofold nature of yin and yang as meaningfully similar to wave and particle in the first place? There are just so many ways to describe the world, and attempts often overlap without producing a eureka of true synthesis. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I... I remember uh, Gould's review uh, in the New York Review of Books very well. It was a review of my second book, The Turning Point. And uh, uh, it was a very uh, sympathetic review. Uh, he called my book a noble failure. <laughs> and and at That's the end right. he concludes it. I still remember it after all these years. That's funny. At the end he says, well, maybe I'm just a New York holy. That's right, exactly what he says. No, <laughs> that's oh, really funny. Oh, and also, I admire Susan Gould very much for for his work. And I think today I can answer him much better than I could at the time. We actually appeared on a on a show of the BBC together mm. shortly after he wrote this review. And nice. again on this show, he bent over backwards. To be, uh, you know, sympathetic to me and appreciate my work and so on. He just said, you know, I can't agree with with this or that. And so, what I would say to him now is uh, that um, in the meantime, you know, the turning point published in 1982 was my first tentative synthesis of the emerging of a new understanding of life in science, which is a systemic uh, understanding. And already in that book, The Turning Point, I was talking about the systems view of life, which, which is the title of the book that contains my final synthesis of, of this view of life. Right. And so what we can say is that this... Um, uh, insight of quantum physicists that at the subatomic level the material world does not consist of separate objects but appears as an inseparable network of relationships that this happens at various levels of complexity and in particular it happens when life emerges uh, it turns out that in a living system a living organism a cell, a multicellular organism, a social system, an ecosystem, the network is the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. So we need to be able to think in terms of networks. And of course, everybody knows about social networks today and also about ecological networks. And to think about networks means to think in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, in terms of context, and this is what systems thinking is all about. And I would just love to have this conversation with Stephen Jay Gould today, <laughs> and unfortunately I can't. I know, it's so sad he's gone. He's, he was such a great mind and such a good guy. Uh, he, he, he quotes then from um, uh, the, the turning point, uh, you, that where you, you, you write, this is how modern physics reveals the basic oneness of the universe. It shows that we cannot decompose the world into independently existing smallest units. As we penetrate into matter, nature does not show us any isolated building blocks, but rather appears as a complicated web of relations between the various parts of the unified whole. Here at the level of particles, the notion of separate parts breaks down. The subatomic particles, and therefore ultimately all parts of the universe, cannot be understood as isolated entities, but must be defined through their inner relationships. That closes the quote from you, and then... Then Steve writes, uh, consider the peculiarity of that last sentence, the subatomic particles, and therefore ultimately all parts of the universe, close quote. The self-styled, Gould speaking now, the self-styled holist and anti-reductionist is finally caught in his own parochialism after all. He has followed, followed the oldest of reductionist strategies, as it is with the structure of physics, queen of the sciences, so must it be by extrapolation with all of nature. You don't exit from this Cartesian trap by advocating holism at its lowest level. 
the very assertion that this lowest level, whatever its nature, represents the essence of reality is the ultimate reductionist argument. I'm guessing now you'd say, well, that you're not you're operating at a well, higher level of integration, not at the subatomic no, particle. No, no, no. I, I, I forgot about this part, uh, and and he's completely right. And I changed my attitude and my mind, and in patterns of connection, I go through these changes. And and so so what what I said uh, you know five years later was that uh, physics is cannot be uh, the uh, the ultimate theory of reality cannot be the ultimate source of metaphors that the, we apply to describe to describe the world because at higher levels of complexity. We have a phenomenon known as emergence, the emergence of new properties that do not exist at lower levels and cannot be explained at a lower level. So, you know, he was completely right at the time, and, and, and I, would, I would very That's happily fabulous. admit that today. I, I love that. That's but great. Change, and in my later writings, you know, I agree with him completely. Yeah. Right. So this is the point of having open dialogue about subjects like this. That's the only way to learn when you've been wrong about something. <laughs> so that's that's great. I love hearing that. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Free Jeff, we've been going an hour and, a, and, a, and I, I, don't, I don't want to let you escape without so. talking about some of the big questions like consciousness. So, uh, you know, as you know, this is right. you were writing about this before any cognitive psychologist our neuroscientists thought this was an acceptable subject. Now it's, you know, all the rage. I get books every every month here for people to be on the podcast to talk about mm -hmm. consciousness. And it's like, okay, wow, this is the thing now. Yeah. Well, so you were kind of way ahead of the curve there. Um, and I think we still don't really have a, a, an acceptable theory for conscious, the so-called hard problem of consciousness, not the neural correlates of, you know, where you see faces, it's right there in the temporal lobe. And if there's a stroke there, you can't see faces, something yeah. like that. But the experience of what it's like to be something. So uh, let's start there. How do you think about consciousness uh, where you started back in the 60s and 70s to what the neuroscientist says now? Yeah. And why have we not solved this problem? Well, we have not solved this problem. And and what, uh, what uh, Chalmers, the, the cognitive philosopher, Chalmers calls the hard problem of consciousness research still exists. But let me start with uh, a positive uh, uh, comment. Um, the, the great achievement of the last few decades is that we now have a theory of mind, not a theory of consciousness, but a theory of the larger phenomenon of mind or cognition, which is the process of knowledge. And this theory is known as the Santiago theory, because it was uh, developed by two Chilean uh, biologists, Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. And it says that mind is not a thing. You see, after all the way, all these centuries after Descartes, who called the mind the thinking thing, the res cogitans, uh, <clears throat> all these centuries we thought that mind was some kind of an entity. Well, the Santiago theory says no. Mind is not a thing, it's a process. It's the process of knowledge, which is closely linked to the very process of life. So every living system is a knowing system. Mind is imminent in living matter at all levels of life. And as physical, biological structures become more complex in evolution, uh, the processes associated with it, the cognitive processes, also become more complex. And at a certain level of complexity, we have brains <coughs> and the higher nervous system, and then we have the emergence of consciousness, which means self-awareness, uh, language, conceptual thought, and so on. And how the... Uh, the living experience of consciousness emerges from brain structures. That's the hard problem of consciousness, and we haven't solved that. We have made some progress, but we haven't solved it. Right. So you would, by that definition, then say a single cell organism following a chemical gradient or a temperature shift or a shaft of light in an aqua, uh, aquatic medium, 
as mind but not consciousness. Yes, yes. And has mind is awkward, you know, uh, linguistically. Uh, I would say is a cognitive system or is engaged in cognitive processes, which are processes of perception, of behavior. Uh, and, and, you know, one interesting um, uh, result has been uh, to recognize the importance of emotions, not in a bacterium, but very early on in evolution, emotions were an important tool to enhance the survival of, of species, an important evolutionary advantage. And uh, emotions go very far back into, into life. Right. So you'll often hear um, cognitive psychologists talk about, you know, when the lights come on in our phylogenetic history, when, when does consciousness come on board? And if I understand you right, you're saying it's more like a rheostat, kind of a, a little dimming of a light, and then more and more, depending on how many neurons you have, yes. neural networks yes. on top of right. neural networks. Right. And, and uh, you know, cognitive scientists uh, distinguish between two types of consciousness. One is called primary consciousness, which has moments of self-awareness that come and go. And, you know, according to uh, the consensus today, this is present in all mammals and in some vertebrates like birds or some higher vertebrates. And then when this becomes an extended and continuous experience, we talk about what I call reflective consciousness because, you know, it involves thought and reflection. And that occurs in the great apes, and, and humans. You mean like the red dot test? You put a red dot on a chimp's forehead, you put it in front of a mirror, yes, and it pokes yes. at it because it knows that's exactly. me. But exactly. if I do that with my dog, he, he yeah. doesn't even know that's himself in the mirror. So right. at some point, right. well, this is the hard problem. At some point, how many more layers of neural networks do you need in the cortex for this self-awareness to come online? Well, uh, there is a very good book about this by Antonio Damasio, and the book is called The Feeling of What Happens. And he has a very elaborate theory of consciousness and of the self, where he talks about the proto-self, which is not self-aware, and then how this turns into self-awareness uh, when when mental images become feelings and so on, it's a it's a very complex theory, and it's a sort of sleight of hand because when you read it for the first time, you think he has really nailed it and he has a theory of consciousness that explains the self awareness, but he doesn't because it's it it sort of still escapes. And uh, I met Damasio shortly after I read the book. And uh, in at at a reception in in Los Angeles, and I asked him straight out. I said, "You know, you you haven't really solved the problem, have you?" And being a great scientist, he didn't blink. He said, "No, I haven't." You know, he he immediately admitted, and and he agreed with me um, that the best approach for now is an approach suggested by Francisco Varela and known as neurophenomenology, which means that we work in parallel with observing uh, brain processes, uh, neurophysiological processes, and observing experiences in a first-hand way. This is known as phenomenology in, in psychology. And so and then make connections between those parallel observations without deriving one from the other. That's the best we can do today. So, Friedrich, if you go to the page for this, this podcast, The Michael Shermer Show, you'll see Antonio Damasio is my guest this week. He's, uh, he, uh, I post twice oh, a wonderful. week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he has a new oh, book out, Knowing, Knowing and Feeling is his new book. It's kind of a reflection on his life's work. So we discussed this, and yeah. I, I think I agree. I mean, we, yeah. we we went through the whole, you know, maps on tops of maps, neural networks on top of neural networks, and and I've always gotten the feeling. I remember when I read the book, and then after our conversation, after we hung up, I thought, you know, at some point there's a gap in there where it's almost like, and then a miracle happens, or and then magic happens, and we're conscious. 
And it's like, that, so here's, here's another way I think about it. And I think maybe I agree with Steve Pinker on this, where he says the problem may be conceptual. That is a problem with our concepts. That is to say, imagining what it's like to be you. Well, I, I can't do that. And, and so, you know, imagining what it's like to be me, you're asking the brain to understand itself. And you, you can't do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, and therefore, it may be more of a conceptual problem than a scientific problem. And that we may just have to say, as a statement of first principle, consciousness exists, that's it. And we have brains <laughs> that engage with it, whatever it is. So, you know, I, w I wonder how far you'll go with this, like m my friend Deepak Chopra, who I think you also know. Uh, you know, he flips yes. it. He says consciousness is the ground of all being. It just is. It is everywhere, and that we're manifestations well, that's, that's of it. A very well known, yeah, that's a very well-known position of many spiritual yeah. traditions. And uh, it's not the systems view that I'm presenting, but who knows who is right, you know? How is that different from your, your systems approach? Well, the systems view says that consciousness is an emergent property. So we have matter, we have life emerging from matter, we have cognition or mind together with life, and at a certain level of complexity, we have self-awareness and consciousness. But I should say that uh, the mystery behind it all comes long before we talk about consciousness. Uh, it, it comes already with the emergence of life. If, if you study uh, evolution and what is now called molecular evolution, which began before the emergence of the first living cell, you will find that uh, tiny bubbles in the primeval ocean were the first protocells with protomembranes. And in order for them to exist, a certain property of water is essential, namely an electric polarity of water, which, which then induces these layers to form the bubbles and the membranes, like soap bubbles, you know. Uh, this uh, depends on a certain property of water. And this property of water, and, and if you want to go further, of hydrogen and oxygen that then combine to form water, this property was there, you know, shortly after the Big Bang. So can we say that life is sort of inherent, you know, in, in the origin of the universe? And if life is inherent, then cognition is inherent and consciousness in, is inherent. And then, you know, we are back to the spiritual view. So maybe there's a way of, you know, synthesizing those two. Oh, boy. Yeah, there's a lot of places we could go there. You know that that gets back to that Teilhard de Chardin new sphere that 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 has to me uh, an uncomfortable amount of magic and, and kind of metaphysical directionality to it. Uh, to me, uh, you still have to uh, have some reductionism, which I I still think you are doing some reductionism. You're just saying you know the, these webs of life, but they're smaller webs and smaller webs or smaller neural networks all the way down to single neurons, single cells, and so on. Uh, yes, emergent emergent properties is is real. Uh, you know, unemployment is a concept in economics that doesn't exist in physics or anywhere else, and it and it's not explained by me well, alone. Right. Whether well, I'm in, I'm either employed or I'm not, but collectively, economists talk about yeah. unemployment. So we, but you have to count each and yeah. every individual person in the economy, and then you add up that's unemployment level rate or whatever. So it would be the same thing with consciousness. You know, Dan Dennett wrote this essay on uh, on consciousness where he he makes an analogy between termites building these magnificent cathedrals, this is in Australia, uh, yeah. that are perfectly adapted for heat and, and ventilation and regulating the heat and so on. But of course, no one termite has any idea this is what they're doing. They're just in there moving dirt around. And, uh, and, and so his analogy is neurons are just cells. They're just swapping, you know, neurotransmitter substances in their ionic channels and the, you know, the synaptic cleft and down the axon it goes and so on. It's just a chemical, electrical chemical process. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, and yet, But you add them all up and somehow, and then here's always the problem, and then a miracle happens or then and then magic happens and we're conscious or something like that. Yeah, so that's the, yeah. the, the rub is how well, do you get those me, individuals me, to collective idea? Well, let me, let me quote 
the great scientist and philosopher Pascal, Blaise Pascal, who was uh, the major French figure in the scientific revolution, who said very beautiful that knowledge is like a sphere. The surface of the sphere is the boundary to the unknown. And as we increase knowledge, so does the surface. So the boundary to the unknown is always there. In other words, mystery is always at the boundary of science. And, and all the great scientists have recognized that we always butt up against mystery. Mm -hmm. Do you know Steve Gould's follow-up to that, though? This is beautiful. That if, no? you take the, yeah, if you take the ratio of the sphere to the volume, as the sphere gets larger, the ratio of volume to the sphere surface area increases. So it's true, the more we know, yeah. the more in, in, uh, encounters with the unknown we have, but the more we know becomes yeah. a higher ratio. We are really actually making progress in, in building knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are making progress. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, you know, the mystery is always surrounding now, the knowledge. Fijof, I, I take it from your work uh, that you're not religious in any traditional sense, although I have no idea what you believe about God or some higher spirit. But everything you've just described implies that there could be built into the laws of nature some directionality to it. Uh, you know, it just uh, uh, inevitable push away from the left wall of simplicity through the laws of nature, and eventually you get animals with brains and cognition and self awareness and and so yeah. on. Uh, and, and as you know, traditional theists argue that's the fine tunedness, and there had to be a fine tuner, and that's what we call God. But Leaving that out, is it possible in an Aristotelian way there has to be a, a first mover, a prime mover, something set the thing in motion? Maybe the multiverse is the answer to this. There's just multiple universes, and those that have these laws of nature give rise to beings like us that ask these questions. Or maybe there's some kind of structure to it that some higher being that we can't even conceive of uh, built into it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I don't. I don't believe in higher beings. I, I grew up in my childhood as a Catholic and then left Catholicism and left religion altogether in the 60s, but uh, uh, maintained uh, an interest and involvement in spirituality. And I would say that I'm a spiritually oriented uh, person, uh, but uh, I don't personify uh spirituality in, in terms of a divine creature. And so uh, a prime mover is not really something uh, that a thought that I entertain. Uh, to me, uh, reality is profoundly self-organizing. And when we go to the origin, you know, we go to the very limits of human thought. That's another area where the mystery surrounds us because we go to the origin of space and time, and it's very difficult for us to think about a world you know, beyond space and time. Uh, I sort of like the, the, the multiverse uh, theory uh, of uh, you know, a, a great number of universes, and you know, one or, or many of them have life in them, and we are in, in one of those. It's sort of almost a, a Darwinian type of, of cosmology. But it's not something that I think a lot about. It's not, you know, one of the areas that I'm pursuing in, in my scientific work and writing. Well, as you know, theists do, do make that argument. To, to your statement, well, the universe is self-organizing, they would say, well, why? Why is it that way? It didn't have to be that way. Somebody or something must have made it that way. To me, I'm I'm just satisfied yeah. in saying beats I, me. I, I don't know. You have to, you have to start will, somewhere, and and maybe will, we'll figure will, out someday. Very slyly, yeah, I would take the easy way out there and say that why questions are not scientific questions. In science, we ask how. You know, how do things work? How can we explain how are things interconnected? But not why are they like this. When you talk about being a spiritual person, uh, I say the same thing about myself. I'm fond of saying Carl Sagan was probably the most spiritual science scientist we've ever had, at least mm. who was a public figure. Well, um, Einstein was. Einstein too, you know? yes, absolutely. So what do you yeah. mean by that? What does it mean to be spiritual without being religious? 
Um, what I, what I mean is is that uh, I uh, seek out certain states of consciousness where I experience a heightened state of aliveness. And this heightened state of aliveness is a spiritual experience. Uh, this is actually the root meaning of the word spirit, which, as you know, is breath. So the breath of life, to experience the breath of life in a heightened state of awareness is a spiritual uh, uh, experience. And uh, the, the, the core characteristic of that experience is an experience of oneness, an experience of belonging to a larger whole. You can experience this in meditation, and I, I do practice meditation, but you can also experience it in sport, in, in music, or any of the arts. And there, there are many uh, opportunities in life to experience a heightened state of aliveness. That, to me, is spiritual experience. Yeah, we just lost uh, Mihai Shik sent Mihai this week. who died at eighty-seven. He was at oh, Cler I didn't know that. Yes, yes, yeah, a couple of days ago. He was at Claremont Graduate University when I was there, and when he was working on his flow mm -hmm. research. And I think, I think that's a good example. Yeah. I when I go to cathedrals in Europe, my wife's from Cologne, so we go into the big dome there in Cologne. It it, it is very moving, oh, even yeah. though I'm I'm an atheist, but. I get yeah. it. I get it totally. It's it's very spiritual. It's yeah. moving. The stained glass windows, the vaulted ceilings, the whole thing. But I feel the same well, way I when I visit the... astronomical domes, like uh, up by you. I go to the. I've been to the Lick Observatory. You know, it's very moving. I go to Mount yeah. Wilson or Mount Palomar. I feel yes. like I'm in a cathedral. Or a redwood forest, like we have here in California. You know, these big redwood forests. They are cathedrals. Yes, that's right. Yeah. A couple more things. So uh, I have to ask you about free will. Uh, as you know, this is another one of these topics that, uh, you know, traditional scientists tend to say, well, we live in a deterministic universe. All uh, effects have causes and, and set aside quantum effects because, the, you know, they're at the subatomic level and they would just wash out at the level of the brain. So in any case, that would just give you randomness, not free will. And yet most of us feel like we're volitional beings making choices. And uh, so how do you square that circle and how do you think about that issue? Well, that that is, in fact, I'm glad you asked the question because that is one of the great achievements of the systems view of life and in particular of the Santiago theory of cognition to really solve this problem, in my view. Uh, what, what happens is that... Um, Living organisms respond, as I said before, respond to disturbances from the environment with structural changes, and they respond according to their sensory apparatus, according to their structure. Maturana calls this structural determinism. So, uh, when I respond to a perception, I do so in a deterministic way, but it's determined by myself, by my very structure, including the genetic structure and therefore the inheritance, in including my memory and the neural structures, that, uh, which means including uh, the culture. So... I respond to the events in my environment uh, according to who I am. And that's what is freedom. If I were not free, my response could be determined by you or by somebody else, by an outside force. I would experience this as, you know, oppression or, or whatever. But I am free because I can respond according to who I am although the response is uh, deterministic when it comes down to the uh, molecular level. And uh, all living organisms have that autonomy, that freedom. And in my view, when we become aware of it through consciousness, we call this free will. So you would say there are degrees of freedom then? Lower organisms have fewer degrees of freedom, no, no, but they have yes, some? Yes, degrees of freedom and also uh, 
we say the the uh, the problem of determinism versus freedom is resolved by saying we are both determined and free. We are determined, but we are determined by ourselves, and that is freedom. Again, I wonder if this is one of this, those conceptual, yeah, you know, these conceptual problems where we're limited by the language we use. Like Wittgenstein talks about this kind of limitation of our cognition no. because of language. No. What do you mean by free? You just said we're determined. How can how can you can't have both? Well, it depends what you mean by these words. Well, we can. <laughs> well, we can because if I de if I determine what I do, that's freedom. If I determine it, that's free, and that's what happens. Yes, right. So there's an assumption there that there's a self. There's a free job capper in there uh, that represents yes. you and not somebody else. Although, as you know, some cognitive psychologists think the self is, a, is an illusion, you know, that it's just, it's just moment to moment to moment. Well, the self as an entity, the self is, as an entity is an illusion. But, uh, you know, what, I, what I have self-awareness. I can distinguish between, you know, myself and my environment, but there's no structure which you can call the self, like the liver or the brain or the... Or, or the lungs. But would that not be an emergent property then? The self is emergent from all the different parts. Absolutely. Like, like, and it's closely related to the emergence of consciousness. The emergence of reflective consciousness is the emergence of the self. And actually, Damasio calls the, the step before that the proto-self. Yeah, well... And yet, even in human behavior, we recognize that, let's say, somebody who has a tumor pressing up against the hypothalamus that causes them to commit violence or pedophile. There's this story in Adrian Raine's book, The Anatomy of Violence, where he talks about Mr. Oft, OFT, the orbital frontal cortex uh, tumor he had mm -hmm. that was uh, causing him to have pedophilic feelings, and then his, his, his wife caught him uh, you know, touching his stepdaughter, her daughter, and then watching kitty porn online and so on. And then they scanned his brain and he had a tumor in there. So they took the tumor out and the feelings are gone. And then he starts acting yeah. out again. They scan the brain, the tumor's back and so forth. And then he makes the distinction between that and a guy named Dante Page, who was this African-American man that committed rape and murder. And he's on death row. He's on, in, on trial for his life. And Adrian Rain was the defense attorney saying, this guy's background is so terrible. I mean, dropped on his head a bunch of times, you know, single mom who was addicted to drugs and, you know, he had no education. He was in a, in a, in a crappy environment and poor food and just on and on. This went on for pages in the book. And you, you feel sorry for this guy. Like he's a victim of this terrible, terrible background. Now you, you scan his brain, you can't see any tumors. But Adrian Rain's point is it's tumors all the way down. It, 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 we're all, we're all determined. Yeah by these, these forces uh, that we have no control over. Yeah. Well, let me come back to Damasio. I remember a statement which, which I like very much about the nature of the self. So he distinguishes, like most cognitive uh, scientists today, between these two types of consciousness. Damasio calls the first uh, core consciousness, uh, which is also called primary consciousness, and the second one that I call reflective consciousness, he calls extended consciousness. And he says, core consciousness is a feeling, and extended consciousness is an idea. Both are real, but neither of them is a separate structure. Interesting. Right. It very much yeah, the, determines the, the how we think great. about these things. Yeah, no, he, he's great. The other way I solve the the problem of other minds, how do I know that you know that that you you're conscious and you're not just a zombie walking around? Is I apply the Copernican principle, uh, which says we're not special, to myself, and that if I have these feelings and express emotions in a certain way, and I see the same cues in you, it's a reasonable assumption to yeah. to make that you feel the same way, yeah. even though I can't get inside your skull. Yes, and that that goes back to the insight that throughout the long history of evolution, nature has used the same patterns over and over again. So we share certain uh, you know, genetic pathways and, and molecular metabolic pathways, 
with the entire living world. And of course, we share much more with our fellow human beings. You think there's any way that your consciousness continues on beyond your body? That is, what do you think happens when we die? Uh, I, I don't have any, any, any uh, really firm opinion on that. I don't think so, but uh, I don't have any firm opinion on that. I mean, obviously, I studied, you know, theories of reincarnation and all kinds of things and afterlife, but I, I don't have an opinion on it. All right, last question. Let's get to the epilogue of your book and the epilogue of your last 50 years of thinking about the big questions. Are you optimistic that we're moving in the right direction? Are you worried? How do you feel about the future of humanity? Well, this is a question I'm, I'm very often asked, and uh, I end the book uh, with a quotation uh, from uh, a writing by Václav Havel, who has been one of the key figures in all these recent political revolutions. And Havel turns this question into a meditation on hope, on the very nature of hope. And here's what he writes. The kind of hope that I often think about and stand above all as a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul, and it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it will turn out. So that has inspired me over the last 20 years or so. Beautifully put, beautifully read. It's a perfect place to end this conversation, Prijap. Thank you.